So we come to the last speaker of the day, and as I told you at the beginning of the conference, I have asked Robert J. Sawyer. This is his latest book. Uh, Robert's not as well known as he should be. He's a writer of science fiction novels. His output is astonishing. Robert writes one novel a year and has done that for the last 40 years. They're um, amazingly believable. They're extrapolations of contemporary science into the future, interwined with plots that I find completely engaging. And uh, the job I gave him for this conference was to sit in on every talk, to participate in every break, to come to every party, and then to come up on this stage and help us make sense of it all. So I'd like to invite Robert J. Sawyer to come up here. And to remember to autograph my copy I'll of I'll autograph book. your copy of Red Planet Blues. You aged me a bit. I've been doing it for 22 years, oh. not 40 years. Right. But, <laughs> but I hope to be doing it for 40 years. So there's a prediction for the future, which is very much what this conference has been about. Indeed. Uh, let us hope that 18 years from now, I'm still plying my trade and Idea City is no, still going strong. No, you'd only be halfway in your time. Only halfway. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, hard act to follow three dozen hard acts to follow, to be the final here. They give you 17 minutes, so it said 1700 zero, zero over there. I'm gonna take 1701, because that's the serial number of the Enterprise, and it has kind of a karmic <laughs> resonance for me. Now, we saw during the course of this, this uh, series of talks here that uh, there were some technological difficulties. Um, some people had a lot of trouble getting their pointer to work. Now, I brought a pointer, which uh, actually works very nicely. There it is. Um, they're probably crafting themselves up there thinking, well, what about his PowerPoint? We don't have that. I don't have a PowerPoint. I just have a pointer. <laughs> but I think the fact that I have a laser pointer is very emblematic of what we've been talking about here for the last three days. Because this was, this started as a science fictional prediction. The first thing that we find in literature that suggests the laser beam is in H.G. Wells' famous novel from 1898, 115 years ago, called The War of the Worlds, where he predicted what he called the heat ray, a coherent beam of infrared radiation. And you can certainly buy infrared lasers today. I set out as a kid, I wanted to have a laser. Uh, I remember the, uh, the Ontario Science Centre had this uh, giant laser, do you remember that? It actually was a leftover from Man and His World, the 1967 World's Fair in Montreal. It came from the French pavilion there, the Ontario Science Centre acquired it, and I said in the uh, 70s when I saw that, someday I'm going to own a laser. My friends thought I was crazy. But in fact, of course, now I do own a laser, and I also think, by the way, can you, can you see what it says right there? Temperature warning. I also think that's very appropriate for summing up Idea City because the intellectual temperature has gotten hotter than most people expected it to over these three days, and we're very grateful to have that there. Uh, this has been, in Moses' words, a gathering of geeks. And it's interesting because I was certainly called a geek in high school. There was a gentleman up here two speakers ago who said, I am not a geek. He's got the most geeky glasses I'd ever seen. I have to say, he has the geek fashion sense, which is very chic to be geek these days. So I want to make a, a distinction because I think Moses did choose the right word. What's the difference between a geek and a nerd? A geek wonders what sex is like in zero gravity. A nerd wonders what sex is like. <laughs> what, what Moses took us through here, whether he realized it or not, was the library of science fictional ideas that have been out there, some going back, as I say, 115 years uh, to H.G. Wells with our trusty laser beam here. Um, we started very early on. We had Don Tapscott, who I had the great privilege of working with. I don't know if Don remembers me, but I remember him. I used to be a freelance science and technology writer. I worked with him uh, around about 1985 uh, when he was doing a, a study on the integration of data, text, voice, and image when that was a radical notion. I was very pleased to see Don as the first speaker here, and I'm honored to kind of bookend uh, somebody I admire greatly at the end here. Um, after those opening, setting the stage things, uh, we were introduced to the concept of robotics, and Moses mentioned that the term 
robot, robota, comes from the Czech, and it comes from the Czech word meaning indentured servitude or laborer, uh, and it comes from a science fiction work, R-U-R, Rossum's Universal Robots, as Moses said, uh, by the great Czech uh, playwright Karl Čapek. And all of the ideas that I saw here, I have to say, I saw people going, wow, that's cool, that's amazing, what a great new exciting idea. Most of these ideas were presaged in the pages of science fiction. And if I have a message that comes out of this, it is that there is a reason that a science fiction reader is here at the end. A lot of people, uh, I, everybody takes a little moment where they sell their product. Well, Moses very nicely sold my individual product, so I'm not gonna do that. What I'm here in a little bit to do is sell my general product of science fiction as a way of looking at the future. We had RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots from science fiction. When we introduced the discussion of of uh, flying cars, what went up on the, oh, I will use my laser, look at that, what went up on the screen over there and over there was a clip from the Jetsons, a science fiction TV show. When we were talking about bioluminescent plants and the case was being made, a clip went up from a movie. What movie went up there? It was Avatar. You used 2001 A Space Odyssey to introduce one of the sections here. And I must say it was the only one of the clips that didn't get a laugh. Did you notice that? All the Walter Cronkite kit clips, people were tittering in the audience that the naivete of CBS Evening News' as anchor in the 1960s talking about our time now, in fact, the past, a decade ago. Uh, but when 2001 came up, we looked at that and we said, that looks real, that looks accurate, that looks like what the future is supposed to be. Now, the date on that, we haven't quite reached that uh, technology yet, but the idea that science fiction was laying a roadmap for us uh, was the subtext I saw throughout this iteration of Idea City, and I've been lucky enough to be at Idea City repeatedly over the years as a speaker. Um, we saw here quantum computing being discussed by uh, the gentleman from D-Wave, which is a Canadian company, and I am delighted with the notion that the world's first commercial quantum computer may be a Canadian uh, a product. Uh, we like to think of ourselves uh, as cutting edge in technology, and we always trot out Alexander Graham Bell and say, no, no, he was in Canada when he invented the phone, really, honest to God. And uh, we invented Superman and we invented basketball, but yeah, we did it in the States, but we may have invented the quantum computer here in Canada, which is a really, really cool thing. And yet, all right, I will mention one of my books. In 1997, I wrote a novel called Factoring Humanity, which was all about quantum computing. This stuff has been in the literature of science fiction now for a decade and a half and more and explained with great uh, facility and simplicity so that people can understand this notion of reaching across to parallel realities and pulling in their multiplicity to let us solve computing problems that would be intractable if you only had one reality in which to do your work. Um, we saw here, and I actually tweeted this, uh, at Idea City we saw 3D printing of death and life. Printable guns, printable biotissue. To me, that juxtaposition was fascinating. Uh, Moses is a maestro, as you know, at orchestrating all of this. And the juxtaposition of those two things was fascinating. But it also, to me, was the most interesting, and, and forgive me, if my co and, and uh, my colleagues were here, and of course, uh, Mr. Black, who just preceded me, uh, of all the speakers who were here, the one who I found most interesting was, in fact, the fellow who had created the printable gun. Not because I think it's a great idea, in fact, I think it's a reprehensible idea, but because he was absolutely right to say that the single most important thing that must happen at a technological juncture is to get not just the upsides, not just preaching from this stage to venture capitalists saying, I've got a big idea, give me a million or a billion and I'll make a reality out of it, but to get the downside into the dialogue as quickly as possible, to start talking immediately about the potential negatives as well as the potential positives. And having this gentleman here saying, okay, now that we've got 3D printers, yes, we can print meat, we can print uh, one of the applications some of you will have seen on the second floor was printing busts of people. There was a discussion of making uh, wedding uh, cake toppers that are actual scans of the couple that are actually being married, their physiognomy being reproduced in three-dimensional printing. All kinds of wonderful and in some ways trivial or frivolous or fun applications. And we need a guy to come along and say, wait a minute, 
there's a downside to that. Well, in general, that guy actually is the science fiction writer. My friend William Gibson, uh, the great writer from Vancouver, uh, said it well when he said the job of the science fiction writer is to be profoundly ambivalent about changes in science and technology. And one of the things that has happened so radically, uh, and we, we saw it here with our, our young gentleman, um, Jack, who was the 15-year-old uh, the cancer researcher who owns his own idea because of the child labor laws, which I thought was a wonderful moment, uh, because he couldn't work at the university because he was underage, so he wasn't paid, so the university doesn't own his great invention. He's gonna be a very, very rich man because of that. But the reality is that almost every idea that comes along these days, the universities have shifted. He talked passionately, and I loved his talk, uh, uh, about um, the necessity of opening up academic research and not having journals behind paywalls. But the part that he didn't touch on except ever so obliquely there was the fact that so much academic research is now geared entirely towards making a buck for the university. That there's very little of this thinking about how we're going to do stuff for, and uh, we had a couple of people mention this, uh, for the good of all humanity. I thought Henry Morgenthaler, who was with us in spirit at best, uh, he's a humanist, I'm a humanist, he, we, he thinks he's completely gone. I think he's completely gone. But through the miracle of television, uh, which Moses, of course, is one of our great Canadian um, uh, pioneers in, we had him here on screen with us, joining us uh, uh, legitimately from beyond the grave. I'm not so convinced about some of the other applications we heard in that area, but we had a legitimate <laughs> dead guy on screen here telling us uh, that he wanted to work for the betterment of humanity, not for making a million dollars or a billion dollars. And I think there's too little of that in the entrepreneurial nature of even university science these days. We had some fascinating talks here, um, and I was always looking for who was going to do the positive thing for the human race, and who had thought about the downsides of what they were doing. We're actually coming up on a great bicentennial. 2018, five years from now as we speak, is the bicentennial of science fiction. Science fiction was invented by a woman. His name was Mary Shelley. She wrote the first science fiction novel. It was called Frankenstein. It was a novel about biotechnology. It was a novel with a scientist as the main character. Nobody had ever done that before. It was also, by the way, a novel about resurrecting the dead, another theme that we had here, not just uh, by communicating across possibly a, a barrier to another reality, but also reanimating re species that have become extinct. We had the wonderful talk about possibly bringing back uh, the Woolly Mammoth, for instance. Um, Mary Shelley invented this notion, and when she invented the concept of science fiction, she very much wanted science fiction to be cautionary tales, to be, if this goes on, what can possibly go wrong? And we need to be very, very careful about that. Now, as a writer, I'm an optimist. I'm a writer who believes that the world is definitely a better place now than it was 50 years ago, and will be a better place 50 years from now than it is today. I am an optimist, uh, but I want us to be sure that when we take an idea, we look at the idea with that very critical eye for the upsides and also for the downsides. Um, there was an undercurrent of acceptability for the science fictional view of things in all of this, particularly when we had the wonderful talk uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Sh Dr. Showalter about Pluto's moons, and of course, what did the public want uh, the unnamed moon of Pluto to be named? We wanted it to be named Vulcan. Well, not because we're big fans of the god that Greeks called Hesphestius, because we wanted to honor science fiction and its contributions to our life. The vision that science fiction has put forward decades in advance of most of what uh, we see in the common wheel, in the public space, uh, is setting the agenda and doing that careful thinking about the potential downsides of so many of the ideas that we were that were presented on this stage. Um, we heard from a number of entrepreneurs and people speaking to entrepreneurs and people who want to be entrepreneurs. Uh, Jeff Bezos is an entrepreneur, and uh, Bob Richards mentioned his involvement in private space exploration. Uh, one of the things that's uh, significant about Jeff Bezos, one of the reasons he did change the world in so many different ways, he's the founder of Amazon.com, the name doesn't ring a bell, is because he grew up 
devouring and still devours science fiction. There is a literature that is about exploring these ideas. The things that we saw here, bioluminescent plants, robots. Uh, I loved uh, our, our friend, the robot, who spoke on the opening day. Um, it was in some ways the most realistic robot I'd ever seen because it was just like my mother without her hearing aids. It couldn't hear what I was saying and it responded just pleasantly just to make the time go by. And I thought, yes, we actually now have a robot that passes the Turing test, which is the test to make a computer that actually can interact like a real human being. The key, apparently, to actually emulating human sentience is just not to listen to what the other person is saying. We do that <laughs> so well all the time. Uh, I also have to say, uh, we talked about, yeah, you all saw in the program book that Conrad Black was appearing by telepresence, and he was going to appear in a video presentation. And I have to say, Moses, that was the most impressive holographic 3D display I had ever seen. I'm a science fiction writer. I see this kind of thing all the time. Time. But you remember Obi-Wan uh, being spoken to by Princess Leia, and she's going, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. <laughs> help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. <laughs> this was perfect. This was like he was really here. It's way better than, than the fake Moses up in the lobby there. You've got to upgrade your technology, I'm telling you. Um, we were privileged to have uh, Conrad Black here in person. And what an interesting talk. And I want to bring it all to the end here because we had um, the wonderful one-man show called Boom. Uh, this afternoon, the 12-minute excerpt from the 90-minute one-man show. And uh, in that uh, excerpt, we saw uh, the, the booms that defined what he considered to be the baby boomer generation. 1945, the boom at Hiroshima, the atomic bomb. 1969, the boom that was uh, Apollo 11 taking off for the moon. And what's interesting about that, and I got a minute and 40 seconds here to tie all this together, and I want to bring in, I guess, uh, 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 Conrad Black's uh, very interesting defense of a character who doesn't get a lot of defense, at least in Canada yet, which was uh, Richard Nixon, is that uh, amongst the things that happened on Nixon's watch was one of the most significant things of, um, of all of human history, which was that second boom, the landing of man on the moon. At Tranquility Base, in the Sea of Tranquility, on the moon, there's the Apollo 11 lander, the lower half of the lander, the part that did not return to the command module. And on one of its legs, there's a curved anodized aluminum plaque. And on that plaque, it says great words. You have to forgive the 1960s sexist language, but great words. Here, men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969 AD. We came in peace for all mankind. And the signatures on the plaque are Neil A. Armstrong, Edwin Buzz Aldrin Jr., Michael A. Collins, and Richard M. Nixon. His name is on the plaque. So he actually has uh, that ultimate vindication. Long after Ronald Reagan is forgotten to cosmic history, long after Barack Obama and Bill Clinton and you name your president is forgotten, Richard Nixon's name is on the moon and will be there when Bob Richards and his crew gets there to mine the asteroids on the moon. I want to thank you all for this wonderful opportunity to uh, uh, sum up for you. And Moses, what a pleasure to be here again. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Good man. Thank you. Thank you. All right.